So hello everyone. Uh, I guess good good morning for you. Uh, good evening for me. And I'm delighted to present Ariel Levine from the National Institute of Health, who will be talking about spinal cord circuits for motor control. Ariel uh, is an MD PhD. She received her PhD from Rockefeller University and then the MD from Cornell University. She started working on spinal cord neurons during her postdoc with Dr. Samuel Puff at the Salk Institute. She established her lab a few years ago in 2015 at NIH. She is running a vibrant lab on very interesting subjects related to molecular, cellular, and circuit level understanding of spinal cord functions during normal behavior and during learning. Ariel, um, the stage is all yours. Thank you. Um, and I want to I want to thank you for um, for the invitation. I also really want to thank the Neuromatch organizers for the creativity and um, the work that I know has gone into this very different kind of meeting um, and to the participants for showing up at like whatever time zone it is for you. Um, so I hope that today I'm going to tell you mostly one story from our lab and most of it is published, not all. Um, but I decided that I'm actually going to tell it the way we really did it, not the way we like wrote it up in the paper and the way you typically, um, you know, kind of prepare your story for, for others. So I'll give you a little bit of behind the scenes, kind of what was going on. Um, so overall in lab, whoop, let's see, why can I not advance? Oh, there we go. Okay. We're interested in the spinal cord. Um, we study the mouse spinal cord for the most part. We're also interested in general in other mammalian species. Um, and the reason is we think the spinal cord is the main link between the brain and the body. So in order to have sensory information come in, motor information go out, but also all of the autonomics, all of the control over your organs and the sensation from them is happening through the spinal cord. And it's not just a passive relay, it's integrating information all the time. And so we really think of it as kind of the magical connection that's making um, everything that happens in your brain, all of these computations actually linked out to the real world and have um, the embodied kind of neuroscience through the spinal cord. So in general, if we look at the spinal cord in one transverse section, um, we can see that locally you get this repeating unit at all of the different levels of the spinal cord. Sensory information is coming in, in the dorsal horn. Motor information, for the most part, it's a simplification, is going out from the ventral horn where motor neurons then contact the muscles of the body. Um, and then there's a big area in the middle that we think of as integrative. And so it's taking sensory and motor information for transformations um, and also importantly, linking that with information coming in from other sources. So the spinal cord is not isolated. It's actually an excellent communication all the time with the brain. So various brain areas, such as um, sensory and motor cortex, the red nucleus in the midbrain, reticular formation, and vestibular nuclei are sending information to the spinal cord. But this is not just like a one-way direction motor command, but rather they're sending information. It's integrated in the cord with sensory information, and then other signals are sent back up to the brain. So I really think of the cord like in dialogue with the brain all the time. Um, and our questions are really about what are the spinal cord cell types? How are they having these functions? So um, overall, we're interested at the cellular and circuit level, also a little bit molecular. And our focus is really more on motor function, but of course the cord does lots of things and we're interested in all of them. So there are kind of two ends to our work. One is to understand the cell types of the spinal cord and the other is to really understand their contribution to behavior. And so we kind of toggle back and forth between um, looking at the neuroscience and looking at the behavior. And this comes through a wide range of ways of thinking about the cell types and behavior, um, including where are these cell types? What is their molecular identity, their connectivity, their physiology? How are they getting their jobs done? And then what are their jobs? What are the computations or their activity patterns? Um, what are they sufficient for and necessary for in motor control? So the first very small vignette, I'm just gonna really show a few slides, but um, I think it's really important, 
is the first kind of set of experiments we did in my lab was to ask what are the cell types of the mammalian spinal cord? And the reason that I think this is really important is first of all, in order to understand how these parts are going to contribute to the sum function of the spinal cord, I really felt that we needed to have a good sense of this. And the second reason I think it's important is it really brings um, to the forefront questions of how are we even thinking about cell types? Are these the meaningful units for function? How are we characterizing them? Um, and in the cord, as with many other places, there are diverse ways to think about cell types. So it can be from where they come in the embryo, their lineage, or molecular markers. We can categorize them by their shape by their connectivity, are they pre-motor, are they post-sensory, things like that, um, and their electrophysiological properties. The problem is that different people have taken different ones, and really none of these have added up to a full schema and framework that we can use to understand function in the adult. And so when I started my lab, I thought, okay, if we're gonna get there, the first thing we need is at least to know who our players are. And we took advantage of the fact that we think gene expression patterns are ultimately what's giving rise to and controlling all of these other features. So there are gene expression signatures that endow neurons with their function. And so we thought, well, if we can go see those signatures, then we can really start to have at least um, an overlaying framework for thinking about the cell types. So we turn to single cell sequencing and I'm gonna skip over a lot of our work here um, so that I can get into another story later. Um, but suffice it to say, we, we had the first um, atlas of the spinal cord, and we've now taken it and integrated it with subsequent studies that came out to have like a really big harmonized set of cell types across different biological parameters. And we can do this um, at the course level. We've also done this now um, at the neuron level. So taking the neurons and really going in and seeing what are their subtypes. And this has allowed us to have, I think, a really refined and exciting idea about what is neuronal heterogeneity in the cord? What is it about? What do different neurons look like? So these are the clusters that we have where each dot here is representing a cell. And when you see these nice groupings, those generally refer to cell types. Um, but what we really wanted to do now is come back into tissue, come back in vivo into function and be able to work with these. And so we went, marker by marker in huge profiles um, doing combinatorial labeling to say, do these truly exist in tissue? Where are they? What is their prevalence? And can we make a map now of each of these neuron types? So for example, I'm zooming in on one family of cell types that we had here. So if we look here, they're, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but they're this group, this green group over um, here, excitatory 14 through 19. And when we zoom in on just that group, we can now use markers to label the whole group, such as SOX5, or to subdivide local neighborhoods, individuals kind of within this family. And so I've given a few examples of those genes here. And then we can go look in tissue and see, okay, SOX5 is the family name, each of these individuals are present, they don't overlap. We can really start to appreciate them and identify cluster um, uh, de definitions for each of these cell types. So we've done this now across nearly a hundred markers um, and this has allowed us to make a real map, a molecular and spatial map in tissue of the cell types of the spinal cord. And this is now what we're using to leverage getting into function, I think, at the level that is meaningful for us. So now that we know what the cell types are, we want to understand how they work but we also know that they don't work in isolation. And so one of our first questions was, how are these cells getting integrated into CNS-wide networks for motor control? And of course we knew that um, some of this was the simple, not simple, they're amazing and complex, but um, previously known descending motor pathways that um, each come down to the cord, they target slightly different areas, which we know now translates to slightly different cell types. Um, and we really wanted to have a good sense of how this is all going. And we started with just a very simple descriptive study again, where we wanted to label all of the cell types that communicate with the spinal cord using AAV retro that we inject into the cord and then look in the brain and see what these nuclei are and these regions. 
And as we expected, we saw the cortex and we saw the red nucleus and vestibular um, nuclei and the reticular formation. What we really didn't expect when we did this, and we thought we were just like laying out some basics, was that we also saw the cerebellum. And for us, that was really, really surprising. Um, to be honest, we wrote it in the paper like, oh, we know there's this pathway and we wanted to know what it did. But really what happened was we were like, there's a cerebellum spinal tract, like what? Um, and the reason is I think, although it is known, and I'll show you the little bit that we knew about it, um, that the, the field has known about it, it really fell out of the textbooks. And so when we try to understand how the cerebellum, which is one of the main regions that has to do with motor control, coordination, motor learning, um, when we think about how it has these effects and how it is able to communicate, for instance, the corrective um, signal for an error, we've always thought that this is going through indirect circuits where it's really hard to track kind of what is the output and what is the particular information. Um, we know that the cerebellum can go through numerous descending pathways. Um, and so to see that it actually has direct access to spinal motor circuits um, or spinal circuits was really exciting to us, um, particularly because it, it seemed then that you could have a system where it has very direct refined access to um, motor outputs, which is makes sense if you think about what the cerebellum does. Um, we were shocked actually that it was, that it existed, that it had been forgotten effectively. Um, and we really feel that for us, this was like a rediscovery. So when we went back in the literature a hundred years ago, of course, people knew it existed. There's nothing new under the sun when it comes to anatomy. Um, but it was, it felt very novel for us and we were super excited. So what I'm showing you here is after an injection in the cervical cord, which is boxed on the left in um, kind of pink or salmon color. Um, then if we look in the brain, taking a section, kernel section through where the cerebellum is, for instance, you see at the bottom, really dark signal. Those are the pyramidal tracks. And you can see a lot of signal throughout the brainstem. Um, but what really caught our eye, and this is really, um, I think, owing to the excellent eye and um, really careful peak that Anu, who's the postdoc who led this project, um, has. So she had done her PhD in cerebellum, and so she was kind of primed for this in a way. Um, she really noticed these absolutely beautiful cells in the deep cerebellar nuclei, um, which are, can you see my arrow or, okay, I'll just, um, in, in this region here. So we thought that this was really exciting and we went back um, and started trying to read about it. And basically a long time ago, people knew that there was a, a cerebellar spinal tract. Um, it had been described by lesion studies back when that's how tract tracing was done. Um, for some reason, there had been some early debate. And I think this probably related to the techniques that people were using. And in Gray's Anatomy from 1918, um, they simply noted that the existence of this tract um, is very uncertain. And so I think around then it kind of fell out of textbooks, but subsequently there had been a short list of papers looking at its anatomy and its electrophysiology. And that was actually particularly important for us because, you know, of course you can find anatomical connections and who knows if they're functional, right? So um, it had been shown that the connections are, um, you can antidromically stimulate cerebellum from spinal cord and you can go in the forward direction and stimulate cerebellum and see signals in the spinal cord. So we felt that this was real and yet almost completely unexplored and potentially very important given the roles of the cerebellum and the spinal cord and motor control. So the first thing that we wanted to do was to just do a basic anatomical characterization using our contemporary tools so that we could really get a sense of like, again, for us, we like to know what is the parts list before we start trying to hypothesize how things work. So we performed injections with AAV retro into different areas of the spinal cord, the main regions being cervical, thoracic, and lumbar that we were interested in. Um, and indeed, we see um, in the deep cerebellar nuclei, we see um, neurons that are projecting to each of these regions. Um, interestingly, there seems to be some somatotopy there that is really exciting. Um, but the thing that was important for us here is that 
Actually, the cerebellum can directly contact each region of the cord. These are excitatory projection neurons, which um, actually in the cerebellum, not all projection neurons are excitatory. So this was particularly important for us to check. And so what we did for this is we injected our AAV retro into the spinal cord and it had BFP. We then used GFP probe to look at it, um, to the, look at the virus expressing cells. And we compared this to um, the glutamatergic marker SLC17A6, VGLUT2. We found that virtually all of the projection neurons um, were excitatory. And um, this was in each of the deep nuclei where we see um, cerebellospinal neurons. So we conclude that they're excitatory. And basically using careful anatomical analysis, Anu was able to divide this pathway into three major tracks or subdivisions. So there's um, a cerebellospinal tract that goes to the ipsilateral cervical spinal cord. And that's mainly derived from um, the anterior interpositus. Then there's a cerebellospinal tract that goes to the contralateral cervical spinal cord. And that's mainly from the vestigial and posterior interpositus nuclei. And then there is an ipsilateral tract that also goes directly to the lumbar cord. And that's completely um, on the ipsilateral side and from, again, mostly anterior interpositus. So the fact that there's this really nice anatomical segregation of the different pathways allowed us to go in and target them individually. So we next really wanted to understand like, what's their function? What are they good for in behavior? Can we start to kind of put them into the map of how we think about motor control? So to do this, we started with DREDS, which is a pharmacogenetic strategy for manipulating um, cell activity in a time-controlled manner. And the time control here is on the order of minutes. So what we do is we inject um, an AAV retro expressing Cre into the spinal cord so that only cells that project to the spinal cord will have this Cre. And then we inject a Cre dependent dread that will silence neurons when we activate it into the cerebellum. And we can do this on one side to target ipsilateral or the other to target contralateral cells. And then for the behavior assay, we deliver the, a, a drug that um, activates um, the channel and silences the neurons and that's called CNO. And so through this tripartite strategy where we are controlling the location through two viral injections and time through our CNO injection, we can have spatiotemporal control over these neurons and then ask what is their role in behavior. So we did this and then we performed actually a very wide range of behaviors, some of which I'll show you um, today, just to kind of get like the lay of the land of what are the kinds of functions that these cells can have. So first I'm gonna tell you um, about our studies on the cerebellospinal neurons that target the ipsilateral cervical spinal cord. Again, these are mostly from the interpositus. So the first assay that, um, that we did is actually skilled reaching. And the reason for that is um, it's known that the cerebellum um, plays a role in this behavior. We thought, oh, these signals are going to the cervical spinal cord. And that's kind of like one of the exciting um, forelimb skills that mice can do. Um, so we wanted to start here. And I just wanna show you a little bit about the assay. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. Um, but basically, in, a mouse is um, given the opportunity to reach for a pellet, and so that's a success. Um, and then it can fail in multiple ways. So it can completely be in the wrong department, like that mouse. It can um, get near the pellet, but then dislodge it. Or it can actually grasp the pellet, but then fail to hold it all the way to the mouth. So we performed this assay and silenced the ipsilateral cervically projecting cerebellospinal neurons. And what we found is that um, actually they really can never get good at this task. So normal animals start with some kind of like low proficiency. And as you train them over multiple days, one session per day, they get better and better. This is an example of motor learning um, and also uh, motor proficiency to get to these like high levels. And we found that when we silence these neurons, um, that the animals really cannot do that. So the question next was, is this about the learning or the proficiency? 
right? So it could be that once the animals have learned, they no longer need this pathway. So we know the cerebellum has a key role in, um, in motor learning. So maybe it's just that. Or it could be that it's required really for the execution of the behavior. And so we took um, a large cohort of animals that were trained normally, and then we silenced these neurons. And actually what we found is that if we just gave these animals vehicle, they were still very proficient. But if we gave them, oh, I'm sorry, this is an error. It should say CNO um, in red then immediately their proficiency and their um, skill level went down. So their ability to carry out the task was really impaired by silencing these neurons even after the learning had occurred. So in this context, we can really say that this is acutely needed online during skilled pellet retrieval. So we next wanted to study um, the contralaterally projecting neurons to try to understand their role um, and so we performed very similar experiments and we tested them in reaching and they were completely fine, <laughs> which is, you know, at first a little perplexing, but it also really shows the specificity of these different anatomical subpopulations. So we thought, well, these are in slightly different nuclei. So maybe these nuclei have a different function. Um, maybe this is more about locomotion. So the vestigial nucleus has a known role in locomotion. In fact, um, for a little while, it was considered to be the cerebellar locomotor region. And it has important roles in posture and um, other features that we thought could be really important in locomotion. So we silenced these neurons and tested all different features of locomotion. Um, and they were completely fine. <laughs> the mice were completely fine. So they ran around fine in an open field. They actually could do a narrow or a wide balance beam just fine. Their gait parameters were completely fine. Everything we looked at was totally normal. And, you know, of course we were kind of like, hmm, what could be going on here? This is a nice chunk of neurons. Um, can we try to understand a little bit more about them? So, we decided to do a more complex um, locomotor task. And for that, we turned to rotor rod. Now, this is a task that involves not just can you walk, like, you know, kind of overground basic locomotion, but it incorporates numerous things that we thought the cerebellum might be involved in, including balance, gait, coordination, and motor learning. So I'm gonna show you an example. So both of these mice had had uh, surgeries, so that's why they're missing some back fur. Um, but I'm going to show you a naive mouse um, doing this task where this rod is rotating and the animal has to learn to stay on. And I think you can appreciate every step is different. There's a lot of balance corrections. You can see it really using its tail. It tends to get far back on the rod and then realize it has to go forward. Um, whereas an experienced animal that's been trained for four days at four trials per day, stays kind of calmly on the front, the top of the rod. Every step looks very similar to the previous step. The tail is used less and this animal kind of like has it down. So if you look at how long they can stay on the rod, which is latency to fall, which is the plot at the bottom, you can see that the animals improve um, over trials and days. And so all of these complex features together go into rotor rod performance. What we found is that when we silence, um, using the CNO strategy at first, these neurons, the animals are really, really impaired in their ability to improve on rotorod. And so um, the, the controls are progressing very beautifully, but the CNO treated animals are falling off the rod significantly earlier. And um, we wanted to, since this was kind of like an exciting finding here, make sure that this was true in multiple ways. So we've also done, um, an independent pharmacogenetic strategy using cord and salvinorin, which is another way to silence neurons. And we see the same phenotype. We also ablated these cells using diphtheria toxin and see the exact same phenotype. So whether we silence or ablate the small group of neurons that go from the um, cerebellum in the deep cerebellar nuclei into the contralateral cervical cord, we get this pretty dramatic rotor rod phenotype. Again, we wanted to know, is this about execution or learning? Because especially rotor rod involves like multiple um, 
motor tasks that the animal has to accomplish. And I think very surprisingly here, um, we found that once the animals were proficient at Rotorod, if we silence these cells, it just doesn't matter. So this really implied to us that there's something that these cells are doing during the actual motor learning acquisition um, that is important. And then once the motor skill is learned, these, these cells are not required anymore. So quite distinct from the role that we saw functionally for the ipsilateral um, cerebellospinal neurons that also go to the cervical cord. Um, again, to me, I think that's like a really cool level of specificity. Um, and what really that got us thinking about is, so these cells are exclusively targeting the cervical cord. And yet they're having a really profound effect on locomotor learning, which is body wide. And if anything, I would say would be more hind limb associated. And so we were really curious um, kind of what's going on here. So just to recap this part at first, um, we specifically looked at the role of the ipsilateral and contralateral cerebellospinal tract. Um, we found that the ipsilateral one is involved acutely online in skilled reaching performance. And I can go into that a little bit more if you're curious, but we basically think it's mainly about um, at the very end of the ballistic reach phase, getting finally to the pellet. The animals are slower there. Um, and the contralateral ones have this really cool motor learning phenotype in Rotorab. So given that we're really interested in what are the cells of the spinal cord and how are they recruited into motor control pathways, as I told you at first, our next set of questions was really about, right now I'm talking about the spinal cord very generically, what are the neuron subtypes that these um, projection neurons are actually targeting? And so we really wanted to know which cell populations um, are really getting these signals from uh, the cerebellum. Again, we know there's this incredible diversity of spinal cord neurons and each of them could carry out slightly different functions. So we wanted to say like really what's, what's the circuit. So we repeated our experiments here um, where we did AAV retro, and now we're looking at the actual um, axons of the cerebellospinal tract, particularly we focused for this analysis in on the contralateral ones. Um, and we look to see where they go. So they actually do their contralateral cross in the cerebellum, and then they descend from there. When we look inside the spinal cord, um, you can see that they're in the ventrolateral white matter. So dorsal's on top, ventral's on the bottom, um, and then they enter the spinal cord gray matter um, and they really terminate very densely in lamina eight. And that was super cool for us because lamina eight is known to be the hub of interlimb communication. So in that area, you have neurons that target the other side of the spinal cord for left right communication and also that go from lumbar to cervical and cervical to lumbar for ensuring forelimb, hind limb communication. So for us, that was really neat because it would provide an anatomical substrate for interlimb communication um, and also for kind of like a body-wide motor coordination um, that could be controlled through hitting just neurons in the cervical lamina eight. So we next wanted to see if these were bona fide uh, synaptic terminals that are happening here, because of course, if we just see the axons, it could be in passage. So we performed a very similar experiment but here we're labeling the synapses, not the axons. So we inject um, a flippo into the um, AAV retro flippo into the spinal cord. And then up in the cerebellum on the contralateral side, we're injecting a synaptophyse infused to GFP. And again, you can see in the spinal cord um, synapses over lamina eight and actually on, also on the boundary between lamina seven and lamina eight. And we confirmed that many of these synapses are indeed seem to be targeting local neurons in that area. So you see them juxtaposed very closely with postsynaptic markers such as PSD95. Um, we next wanted to ask, okay, so now we've narrowed it down. We know um, that it's in this region. What are neurons in this region that could be helping to carry out the functions of cerebellum and motor control? So um, we, 
first looked at, um, we looked at a number of cell types. So for instance, we looked at V2A neurons, which are known to get brainstem inputs and cortical inputs. Um, we looked at um, cholinergic neurons. We looked at a, a number of possibilities, but one that I wanna highlight today that's positive um, was a group of V1 interneurons, which are segmental inhibitory neurons in the cord. Um, so we basically um, used genetics to label these neurons. And indeed we found many inputs onto them. So this would be one way that the cerebellum can access local circuitry for, for instance, head and neck control, um, particularly in the upper cervical cord or forelimb control in the lower cervical cord. And that's quantified here. Um, and then I just wanna really highlight Anu's amazing work here because this is very heroic. I'm sure you can see in our schematic how many injection symbols there are here. Um, so Anu injected the lumbar cord so that we could see all neurons that target the lumbar cord. She injected the cervical cord so we could see which are the cerebellospinal neurons that are targeting that region and the cerebellum. And that allowed her to see the long descending proprospinal neurons that extend from the cervical cord down to lumbar and the fact that they get inputs from the cerebellum. So this is now a three part circuit in one section that we get to see these connections. So it goes from cerebellum to cervical to lumbar. And I think technically that's like really, really impressive. Um, so to summarize that part, these neurons are targeting at least two different kinds of spinal neurons, probably more. The V1 segmental neurons and long descending spinal neurons. And I should note that these um, yellow long descending spinal neurons get convergent input from other descending pathways such as reticulospinal neurons um, as well. So they may be kind of like bringing together these different descending inputs into one integrated um, node. In addition, these neurons target multiple other areas in the brain, in particular, other descending motor control pathways. So we're really interested in the idea that they actually bind together descending inputs, maybe for time purposes, for synchronizing, um, or for other reasons. And, um, you know, really kind of thinking about them as uh, linking together motor control circuits throughout the CNS. So I hope that um, I've showed you today that um, I think we have really exciting work identifying at least functionally and bringing into the modern age a fifth descending pathway for motor control. So in addition to the four that we knew before, there's now a fifth um, and that's really exciting. Um, and one thing that I would just note is actually now that we've been reading more and more, there is a ton of minor quote unquote pathways that connect the brain and the spinal cord in both directions, descending and ascending. And I think that having a more nuanced idea about how these circuits are connected um, will allow us time kind of to get to that next level of function, thinking about how information is moving through these systems. So finally, um, I just wanna conclude with some of our like ongoing work and where we're headed. Um, we want to identify and characterize spinal cord neurons associated with very simple movements, um, then probe what their functional contributions are. We're, of course, really excited to see how they're integrated into broad networks throughout the CNS. Um, and lastly, we're really interested in applying this knowledge to um, discover new or refine existing therapeutic targets for spinal cord injury and stroke. Um, so this is our group um, and I'm really like, I just love them. It's a great group and I really wanna thank them. So the work that I presented today, the um, cell type analysis was mainly done by Daniel and Ryan. Um, and the cerebellus final story was done by Anu with a lot of help from um, Arna, who's not pictured here, who's in Alex Chesler's lab and from Courtney. So you can see Anu and Courtney doing some skilled forelimb reaching. Um, and that's our group. Uh, doing some motor control and I guess showing all of the variability of like what can be there. Um, so I want to thank our group um, and my, our institute and INDS and all of our amazing collaborators, um, and particularly Stephanie Koch and Alex Chesler who contributed to the work I showed you today. And I guess I'll take any questions. Thank you, Ariel. This was a really exciting talk and we have some questions. Okay. So uh, the first one is for Mike Mikeis. Mike, would you like to uh, go live and ask your question? Oh, I can just read it out. 
so the question for your skilled pellet retrieval task, do you see individual variation in performance of each uh, of your wild type experimental mice? Also, what was the sex of the mice? Yeah, so, okay, I'll handle the second one. Well, they're both very easy. The answer is yes, <laughs> and male and female. So we use male and female equal distribution for everything, for our histology and our behavior. Um, and we do see individual variability. So um, I, in the plots I was showing, that's mean and standard error, but you see um, for sure, there are some animals that seem just not motivated and others that you know, are, are really on it. And then there are animals that start off motivated and then they get bored with the task. Um, the way that we run the task, we embrace some of that variability. So the animal is freely moving, um, the task is a little harder because it's on a pedestal instead of like on a shelf. Um, and we're interested in that variability. It's one of the features that we look at. Um, so I would say for sure. And there are ways to modify the tasks. You have less variability. Um, yeah, that's how we do it. So next question is from uh, Gregory, sorry, uh, PLC. So would you expect the contralateral tracts to affect the learning of other skilled walking similar to water road? For example, has there been any consideration for skilled ladder walking? Yeah, so we did not do skilled ladder walk. I, so I think that's a great question. Um, and I would say, I am not convinced we really understand how um, skilled walking and other gates that are not just free time dependent, speed dependent, sorry, um, go. And um, I'm, I'm really interested in that set of questions. We did not do ladder, we did do beam. So the way that we do beam is the animals do get multiple sessions to get better and better at it. Um, and we did not see any effect there, but I think you're right. Um, irregular ladder would be a cool way to do this as well. Um, I would say overall, we, I think it's a great idea to broaden out the behavior to see what are the particular features that are perturbed. Um, but I also feel that some, like in general already, these behaviors incorporate so many broad things that I think rather we like to take the point of view of like, okay, now let's think about all the components that go into Rotorod and are they perturbed? Um, but it's a great question. So next one, Daniel Dotan, would you like to take it live? You can open your mic. No. Nope. So the question, does the neurons projecting ipsilaterally or contralateral show different arborization of collateral, such as terminals within the gigantocellular or the olive nuclei? It's a fantastic question and we don't know. Um, so we focused first to just say like, at least for one subtract of this population, which is really like, you know, between dozens and low, I think low hundreds of cells per mouse, what is its pattern? And we did not do it for the lumbar or the ipsilateral yet. Um, and I think it's a great, great question. I expect because they're basically in different deep cerebellar nuclei that they will have different outputs throughout the brain and maybe also within the spinal cord. Um, and we know that they have really different functions. So I expect the answer is yes, but I have no idea. So if at put, if at, would you like to go live? Would you like to ask your question? Is everyone really shy? <laughs> I think so. Okay, I mean, I'm happy to hear people like speak directly. It's kind so of- So if is asking, um, okay. um, do you think that a similar pathway exists also in higher animals, non-human yeah. primates? If so, what is the relative size of this pathway compared to the cerebellar, cerebellar robo spinal system? By the way, uh, you are very complimented. I mean, people, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, thank you. Yeah, I can't see the chat. So like, that's really yeah. nice to know. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, Just to mention. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it definitely exists um, in, it's been examined in non-human primates. I think that the relative size, I don't think we know. Um, you know, I would say that this is kind of what 
you know, like really, I think it had been forgotten from the textbooks and it's understudied. Um, and, you know, I, I would really love to see these kinds of studies going forward now that we know it's there and it might be really cool. Um, yeah. So I guess we have uh, time for maybe one more question, maybe more. So Lena Ting, uh, do, do you want to go live? Lena? Okay, so she's saying, this is a beautiful work. I wonder if you can target descending neuromodulatory cells providing serotonergic drive. Um, yeah, we should be able to. So you mean technically, can we? Because that should be um, a different population of cells. But what we can do is inject AAV retro into the spinal cord um, with Cre, and then have... Um, sorry, with a Cree dependent cargo and then use um, a serotonergic line that has Cree um, elsewhere in the animal to, to have intersectional targeting. Cool, um, I, think I, I think my volume's back on. Awesome, it, I don't know much about this, but it, would it be like an on off or could you have graded kind of activation? Yeah, I think that it's hard to say graded without, um, you can say graded to the behavior, but to say graded for modulation, I think you'd need to be recording from the cells and we're not particularly set up for that. Although I think that's appropriate way to do it. Um, but theoretically, yes. I mean, many of the ways that you can control neurons, you can grade the dose and then you can see the effect. Um, but unless we were, yeah, unless we were recording, I think that would make me nervous to make claims. About oh, I see. Mm -hmm. Cool. So I guess we have uh, three more minutes. So next question is from Robin Mildred. Uh, Robin, are you? Uh, do you want to ask live? Okay. Maybe I just read it. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Hi. Yeah. Hi. So I'm really interested in um, the cerebellar input to proprio-spinal neurons and potentially linking limbs and coordinating limbs mm -hmm. and I was wondering if you've tried to come up with some sort of like paradigm to test that behaviorally maybe with a knockout or something like that um so we have not so do you mean like directly perturbing the long purpose spinal neurons or, or the cerebellar input that might perturb per, input to propio spinal neurons and then maybe looking at how that changes coordination or something like a split yeah. belt treadmill where you're changing yeah, yeah, yeah. coordinate limbs. So we have not, that's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, I, I should ask Megan Carey or, or someone else who does split belt. Um, I think that we only looked for limb coordination at basic gait parameters. And I think that that's like a kind of poor way to do it because the truth is that the anim those gate parameters are really robust to descending changes, right? Like the animal can basically get around walking normally um, pretty robustly. And so using a technique that would draw out those differences, I think that's a fantastic idea. So similarly to the earlier question about um, the irregular ladder, I think in that context, you know, if the forelimb stumbles, you can see what does the hind limb do in the next step or two. Um, would be one way, or having the split belt, forelimb versus hind limb, or right versus left. I think those would be really cool questions. Yeah. So I guess before we are being cut off, uh, I would like to thank you for this really, really great talk. Thank you. And uh, looking forward to see uh, your uh, new stuff. Uh, I guess we can have another question, and if we are cut off, that's fine. <laughs> So, Daniel Dotan, would you like to ask the question? Uh, if not, I can read it. Uh, any effect on rotation, tail body head rotation, or cervical rotation? That might be, here's Daniel is here. Yeah, Daniel. Yeah, it's, it's a fantastic question. Sad to say, like, our ability to do, to chase down these questions outstripped our abilities as we were setting up really refined behavior assays, which we now have. And so this data was collected with like single camera, um, you know, not the resolution that we would want. Um, 
but we're now completely set up to be doing that, right? So I think that being able to study whole body coordination requires a different level of um, the data itself and then the analysis. And I 100% agree that that's, you know, kind of where we want to be, particularly because, for instance, of the cerebellospinal neurons that project to V1, which is that inhibitory subtype in the ventral spinal cord, those were mainly at the very rostral levels of the cervical cord, which we think would be neck and head control, which of course can set the stage for, you know, obviously everything um, in terms of posture and alignment. Um, so I think, again, great question. And unfortunately, I don't really know the answer. Okay, so I think uh, we are done. Awesome, thank yeah. you. Thank you for thank the opportunity. Thank you very much, yeah. Great. Take care. And if anyone has other questions or wants to get in touch, please just email me. Thank you. Bye. Bye.